Hi everybody, welcome to your Philo Mollusca video notes. So first, before we get into all the different types of animals in this phylum, let's talk about just some structures overall of mollusca. So the Latin, in Latin, the name itself means soft bodied. And actually, even though we know about a lot of very large ones like the giant squid and the giant clam and all of those animals, 80% of mollusks are actually less than five centimeters in size. They have three main regions, the head foot, the visceral mass, and the mantle. These organisms, once again, like the ones we've been studying, have bilateral symmetry and protostome development. In addition, we are seeing true coelomates, so they have a true body cavity. They also have something kind of unique to them called a radula, which helps them scrape food, and that structure is modified in some of your cephalopods. And they also have an open circulatory system, but once again, cephalopods are a little bit different. So those three body regions that we talked about, first you have the head foot region. So in this animal to the left, you see kind of a typical snail diagram. So the head part is for nervous structures, their brain, their eyes, their sensory, and then the foot is for locomotion. And this foot is modified in cephalopods. They have usually have tentacles and arms and things like that. But in a bivalve or a gastropod like the snail we see, it's a foot that's used to crawl along the bottom of the ocean or on land. The visceral mass has all the essential organs. So this is where everything important is for the animal. In many of these animals, it's all within the shell, but um, some animals like a slug, for example, it is not contained in a shell. And then lastly, you have the mantle. So the mantle is what attaches to the visceral mass. It's this blue structure you see over here, and it also secretes the shell, except once again in cephalopods because they don't have a shell typically. So as promised, a little bit of the diversity of phylum mollusca. So there are eight classes that we will talk about. Honestly, we're going to spend a majority of our time talking about these three here because those are the largest classes and the most is known about them. We'll touch briefly on polyplacophora and then those bottom four we'll get to in just a moment as well. So first up, gastropoda. So this word means stomach foot. So gastro stomach poda foot, you're going to see poda a lot. So make sure you know that that's associated with foot. It is the largest and most varied mollusk class and members of this class can be monoecious or dioecious, meaning they're hermaphrodites. They have both sex organs or they are not. They are male and females that have to mate to produce offspring. Most members of this class have shells and they have that flattened foot to help them move as well as a radula to help them scrape their food. They also have something called an operculum. So if you've ever picked up a seashell and you see kind of like a darker structure and you're like, I don't know if it's alive or not, but if you can't go in the shell and it's covered, that's that operculum and that closes that opening and keeps that animal safe inside the shell. Torsion is the term for how the animal moves into the shell. So they actually twist 180 degrees to bring their body into the shell. And then some examples of members of this class are things like snails, sea slugs, conchs, limpets, those are all members of gastropoda. And as you know, most of them do have shells. However, the ones that don't have shells, like your sea slugs, are not defenseless. Fun fact, they actually will keep nidocytes. Remember, those are the stinging cells from jellyfish. The ones that they eat that are not charged or haven't been released to sting, they actually keep them and use them themselves to protect themselves. So a little bit of fun fact there. All right, so here's just a look at your gastropod structure, and I want you to go ahead and pause here and fill out the diagram on your notes or sketch this and label it in your notes. So a little bit more about shells. So I'm sure at some point, many of you have collected shells in your life, or you know someone that likes to collect shells, or maybe you wear shell jewelry. So a little bit about that. So shells themselves are made of calcium carbonate. And to kind of put that in, into perspective into how it's made, it's layers and layers of this. It's like putting down steel and then pouring concrete over it. So you have your support and then you pour your concrete to give that full effect, which is how the shell is also made. Going back to ecology and kind of some of the human impact, ocean acidification, though, is harming shells because it's breaking down so that calcium carbonate is getting broken down by the excess acidity in the ocean water. And then as a result, the mollusks, the mollusks die because they don't have a shell to protect them. And then lastly, the seashell trade. So 
when animals are harvested for their shells, it's not like, oh, look, I found this super cool shell and there just happened to not be an animal in it. Many of these shells that you see over here in this picture to the right are harvested with live animals in them. And then they're just taken ashore and put out in the sun to dry out until the animal dies. And then they're like cleaned and dumped in oil and chemicals and all sorts of things to make them look shiny and make sure there's no remnants of the animal inside. Also, fun fact, um, one of the most common things confiscated at U.S. custom ports are actually illegally obtained shells. And the most prized ones are listed there, but they are also protected, luckily. If you want to read a little bit more about this, there's a QR code you can scan as well. So next up, class bivalvia. So bivalvia means two valves, or valves are like halves of a shell. So this is like your clamshell. They have a complete digestive tract, and they're mostly dioecious. They also have no head or radula. So members of this class are filter feeders. They filter in water, much like a sponge, and they get their nutrition that way. They also have adductor muscles used for defense. You've probably witnessed this if you've ever picked up like a clam that was still alive and you try to pry it open and you really can't. It's really hard to pry them open because of those muscles. They do, however, despite not having a head, they do have a foot, which is what they use to burrow. And they use something called a siphon, which is how they take in and release their food and water that they filter. Also, as I'm sure you know, many of these species are edible, and then, of course, some form pearls. Examples here are clams, oysters, mussels, and scallops. So here's a bivalve structure, and once again, you can pause here and label this diagram or draw it and label it in your notes. So, and then just a little bit, everyone's always very interested in pearls and how those are created. So here's just a quick little blip on pearls. All right, so that's just a little bit more information for you on pearls. So now we're on to class, ce class cephalopoda, and these are perhaps the most widely known mollusks, but also the coolest. They have a lot of really unique features that set them apart from other members in this phylum. So the name itself means head foot. They are the most complex mollusk class. So as I'm sure you know, octopus, for example, they're very, very smart. They have a complete digestive tract again, but this time these members have a closed circulatory system. They do have that complex nervous system with a brain and eyes, and they have a foot that's modified into tentacles and a siphon, which is how they can kind of like jet away or even hunt their food. Males, um, when they mate, males actually transfer spermatophores, which are little like sperm packets. They take them from their mantle and they actually have the special tentacle that inserts them into the female mantle. So this is how most members of this class mate. And they also, like we've mentioned, have no shell. So the cuttlefish does have a cuddle bone. Um, the squid has like a pen, which is a very like thin structure. And then the nautilus does have a shell, but for the most part, these animals are shellless. They use that jet propulsion for movement and they have adhesive cups on their arms or their tentacles, which help with prey capture. And they have that sharp beak for eating. And then chromatophores, they're most widely known for this. Um, they can release ink to protect themselves and they can also change colors. So here's just a look at the different structures. Um, you can go ahead and pause here and just kind of examine the differences between them. So we have an octopus on the left. This is a nautilus in the middle. So remember these have a shell. And then we also have a cuttlefish on the right. 
So like we talked about, the octopus is pretty cool. So this is just a link showing you um, how an octopus can actually fit through a very tiny hole. So I'm going to skip around a little bit, but. So pretty cool what they are capable of. So the final class we're going to talk about in detail is class polyplacophora, and this poly meaning many, so many plates. These ones have a reduced head and a flattened foot, and they actually have eight valves that their shell is divided into. And the main example in this class is the chiton. So other small classes of mollusks, like we talked about, class scaphopoda, it's just boat foot is the meaning, and these are your tooth or tusk shells. Monoplacophora means one plate, and these have an undivided arched shell. And then two smaller classes, class cotophoviata and class solenogastres, are both worm-like classes, and they live in either deep water or surface areas of coral reefs. So mollusks are also very delicious, right? So just kind of some fun facts for you, a few of the different ways that people eat mollusks, mollusks around the world. So you have clams, which are common in chowder, clam chowder, snails or escargot, that's in this bottom right hand picture there, it's a French dish. And then squid is calamari, and this is actually the squid body chopped up into rings and then deep fried. And then things like oysters, mussels, scallops, abalone, and conch, or conch fritters, as you see in the upper right-hand corner there. Mollusks also have a really important role in the environment in that they are bioindicators. So because they filter water and many of them don't move, they are great indicators of water quality. So plastic, back to ecology once again and human impact, plastic has been found in many mollusks all over the world and some mollusks even in uninhabited areas have been found with plastic, meaning the water currents carrying it. In addition, in the Oregon Bay, which is where a lot of different bodies of water dump into the Pacific Ocean, Mussels have actually been found with traces of opioids, and then oysters have been found with traces of ibuprofen, antihistamines like Benadryl, and antibiotics, which means that our filtration system is still, those things are still ending up in our water, and then these mollusks are filtering them as a result. And then lastly, mollusks despite being good for many ways, some of them are not good, like the zebra mussel. So the zebra mussel is considered an invasive species. It came from ballast water, which you see an example of what that would be up there on the left, it coming out of major freighters as they moved into the Great Lakes region. This map here now shows how far they've spread throughout the country. And remind, to remind you, these aren't even native to North America. They came from Eurasia. Um, they are super filters, so they filter water really, really well, making it really clear, which looks pretty, but it gets rid of all the algae that local species need to eat. And in addition, they attach to native mollusks, such as mussels, like you see in the upper right, and they clog power plant intake, which also is very, very expensive for those power plants. And that concludes your notes.